This is Ship It with Justin Garrison and Autumn Nash, a podcast about everything that happens after Get Push. Ship It is brought to you by Fly.io, the home of changelog.com. Launch your apps close to your users all around the world. Learn how at fly.io. Hello and welcome to Ship It, the podcast all about what happens to code when it becomes software. I am your host, Justin Garrison, and with me as always is Autumn Nash. How's it going, Autumn? Uh, it's still Sunday. We still have coffee. <laughs> <laughs> hey, these episodes are a week apart from our last one, so no one knows it's still Sunday. They don't know that we're recording back-to-back intros. It could have been the next Sunday. Don't tell on me. Like, gosh. <laughs> We have a little bit of a backlog of our guests, which is great because we're trying to get a little ahead before summer and, and we might we need to travel and take vacation time. And children, don't forget. Kids are out of school. We and, have a lot of tiny humans between the two of them. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> and so it would be nice to get ahead of those things. So we're recording some of these episodes and, and they are released in a small trickle, uh, but not too far removed from when we record them. <laughs> I mean, also, like, be real, we're going to send each other articles and talk about this stuff. We either do it for the podcast or do it when nobody hears. <laughs> yeah, that's true. <laughs> uh, and on today's show, we have uh, Andrew Atkinson, who is going to talk all about uh, Postgres and Postgres database and a lot of interesting, like, I'm not a database person, so I'm learning a lot. I was geeked about this. Just because the Postgres like community is really friendly and I had met Henrietta and I wanted to go to the Chicago Postgres day, but it was just too much back to back after scale and awesome and then possibly Grace Opera, but I'm geeked to talk to them. Yeah. So it was a great, uh, it was a lot of fun uh, talking to them and, and learning more about it's just, I, I don't know anything about the Postgres community. I've never been a part of it. Uh, the only time that I like managed postgres was i was like oh why are these commands different than uh the mysql commands <laughs> you know <laughs> so, i love me some data and databases like so before we get to that interview we have a couple links to share as always in our intro Adam, why don't you go first oh you set me up no <laughs> <laughs> okay so this week my link is kind of techy i guess it affects everybody but nobel prize winning harvard economist uh claudia goodland or oh, goldland uh says that we will never uh, close the pay gap unless this happens. So basically- wait, wait. If oh. there's a spoiler there, like what is the thing that needs to happen? Well, what do you think so far? I don't know. Like maybe uh, companies need to uh, pay more equally. It's almost, I don't know, ironic how simple- it is, but it complex at the same time, I guess. Like, I think like it's almost like we needed somebody who was Nobel Prize winner to tell us this, but at the same time, like, please scream it from the rooftop for the rest of us. <laughs> like, so she's basically saying that we can't get gender equality in the workplace and pay- change the pay gap unless we get couples equality. But it's interesting because it also talks about, so basically, she calls the jobs greedy. So the jobs that really pay good salaries, they call them greedy. So it's greedy with your time, right? It's greedy with your work-life balance, et cetera. But most women, because you're typically caregivers or you you could be your parental caregivers, it could be marital caregivers, it could be disabled spouse caregivers, and obviously a lot of us are mothers, but mostly it's mothers. So they talks about how women have to take the more flexible jobs which is a job that may be remote, which is a job that may have better work-life balance, which ends up getting us paid much less. And it's interesting with the way that RTO is going and the way of um, there's been a lot of articles about how women aren't having enough children. And we're saying like the generations will not have enough people to take care of like our generations and the generations before us because women don't want to have kids anymore. And a lot of women aren't having kids. And it's like really interesting, like we're being pushed like, hey, if you don't have enough kids, society is going to like, you know, crash and burn. But then it's like, but you're going to like, we're going to pay you less. You're going to always have a lesser job. And at the same time, like 
housing and childcare and, and like food are astronomically expensive. Like childcare is as much as my mortgage. So you have two mortgages. Yeah, basically. And it's like, it's wild because they, uh, I read an article and it talked about two different middle classes and there's the middle class that has like a house that was bought like 15 years ago. Right. And no kids in childcare. And then there's like the new generation of the middle class that you make all this money, but you have kids in childcare or you bought a house in the last couple of years and you are two different income levels. Like you may make the same amount of money, but you are living two completely different lives. And it was really interesting. And it talks about how like women are only able to really do well in the workplace when they have 50, 50 relationships, but also when jobs are more flexible because it then gets to the point where it needs to be flexible for both partners. So when you give a man a more flexible job, it also helps the gender pay gap because they can then be better partners. So it's really interesting. So like flexible work work is actually how we will get to better equality in the workforce. Yeah. I have always had a very strong stance on my work-life balance. And even when I worked at Amazon- You are one of the first guys though that I've ever met. Like I remember one of our first like video calls and you were like, I have to work remotely because I like pick up my kids. And most guys will not say that. When you say that in a workplace, you make it easier for people like me because then it's not like looked down upon. Like I think the way that like a lot of like the workforce is going, the more people that accept being treated a certain way makes it harder for women because we don't have that option to just be like, my wife's going to go pick up the kids. <laughs> so like that is a big deal when people like you say that, like I have people I work with and be- when they say those things, it makes it so much easier for me to stick around, you know? And like, I really enjoy that. Like I, I drop off and pick up my kids from school almost every day and, and I'm going on a trip next week and it's my responsibility to find someone that is going to drop off and pick up my kids. And, and I asked my wife, Hey, are you able to do this? Like I, this is something that I take responsibility for, but like, I feel like a lot of that for me came from, from this article, like those greedy jobs and, and just really the, like, we have to like success is this money or monetary thing or ownership. Like I really, really try to define my success by waking up happy. That's so true. More days than I wake up not happy. And if that ratio is starts going in one direction, like I have to figure out why. I have to figure out what's changing. And maybe that's because like I could be tired and happy. And as long as I want to wake up and I want to get up and I want to face the day, like that to me is more successful than the higher paying job and taking pay cuts and working remote and doing those things and being involved with my kids and, and having like knowing my neighbors is a surprising big impact on my happiness in life. That also helps your family though, because then if God forbid you can't go pick up your kids or something bad happens, you now have a community because community is important. Right. Having that local community where I live and like having communities online, having communities in open source, having communities in social media. As a military spouse, I didn't have that community for years. Like there was nobody to put on my kids like pickup list, you know, like it was either you get there or you're screwed. Like you'd put like random strangers that you just met two weeks ago <laughs> on your kids pickup list because you didn't yeah. know anybody. Yeah. There's a big difference between having a community that I see often face to face and we have this shared community of locality versus the shared community of interests. And in my interest communities, I love them. I love being part of them. They help me grow. I hopefully help them grow in some ways. But like that is a very different community than the neighbors that live on both sides of my house, the neighbors that live across the street from me and anyone else that I see walking around my neighborhood. Like those are Mm -hmm. the people that I try to get to know, at least as a, I know your names, I know your kids, I know at least where you work. Like that is a really important thing. That's also safer for your kids too, because now if the people, if they go over those people's house, you actually know them. You know, yeah, it's wild. And I know which houses I don't want them to go to. Right, like that's like both sides yeah. of that are, are very helpful. <laughs> but having that knowledge and also knowing your kids' friends is really important. Like there was a little girl who committed suicide, and she was beautiful little girl, and it was because she was getting bullied so hard at school, and they had to switch her schools. And like it was crazy because they, her mom had to put her in a school where she worked closest to. And it's like, dude, I remember being a kid and like everything feels so big as a kid, you know? And it's just wild. Like you like just the opportunity for me to be there for my children and be around is like such a big deal, but that's a privilege, right? Like the privilege, like as a single mom, I don't always have the privilege to say, to turn down a job, you know? Yeah. Yeah. 
so it's wild where all this will shake up. Like we, I feel like we were getting closer to closing that gap. And does this mean that we're now going to get farther away? You know, it's wild. Yeah. But I think a lot of that, like the 50 50 ness of it's uh, also comes down to just like, like for me at least was redefining what I wanted to do, like what I thought was successful. Mm -hmm. And, and the more I thought about, Hey, you know what? Like I would rather be happy than rich is like a huge mind shift for me as a dude that has all the benefits in the world uh, and a little bit of social pressure of like, Hey, you gotta be successful. I'm like, actually, I don't think my definition matches yours and that's okay. And, and it I, sucks. Like, Cause that's a, like a privilege to be able to like pay your bills still and to be able to do that. Absolutely. Absolutely is. And, and, and that has helped me more in being able to like have more flexibility in my schedule and knowing that like, this is important to me. I'm not going to schedule that meeting during this time because that's school pickup. And that's like, uh, I'll either take it from the car or I won't, I won't do it. It's fine. And we will no time. It's also awesome because it, that's also why you like being your friend as a woman is so much easier because like, I don't have to explain certain things to you. Like we can be real friends in real life. We're not just people yeah. that like talk <laughs> to each other on the podcast. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like, and I think that also makes like, our podcast better. Like, I think that makes you a better coworker. It makes you like, I'm guessing your relationship with your kids is really cool. Right. You know what I mean? Like it's, it's crazy how those choices like affect multiple areas of your life. Yeah, for sure. Like it, it, there's always those trade-offs. And, and I think that this article really points out that like the first step happens from that, like just responsibilities at home and cognitive overhead of like, who's planning the birthday party and who's doing the yes. laundry and who's doing the dishes. Like all of those things add up so much that it's like, Hey, who's, who's just responsible for dinner tonight. Yes. And, and that like stuff, those little things, like having like consideration is one of the biggest, like it is not a little thing when you have kids, <laughs> especially one picky eater. <laughs> and it is like now <laughs> I think people think like you have to do something amazing, right? Like you have to volunteer your time and do all this. But like consideration of your coworkers, of your spouse, like and speaking up, like when you're in a meeting and somebody says they have to go pick up their kids, when you speak up and you're like, yeah, dude, me too. Like, <laughs> you know, like it is huge. Like it is so huge. I saw that actually on a PowerPoint at a tech conference and somebody goes, letting people show up to work as who they are. And when you, it's really easy to just be like, Hey, you have a cat. I have a cat too. You have, do you have human babies or fur babies? And then when you're in a meeting and you kind of co-sign, like someone's like, I have to go for an appointment or I have to pick up a kids. And then you're like, me too. Like when you're new on a team, that makes you feel really included and safe in that space, you know? And I think that one of the biggest downsides of remote work is everything becomes transactional because you have to get work done in a certain amount of time because you have that flexibility. So you're trying to either cram more in less time. I think it depends on your personality because I can talk to anyone anywhere and be besties. But you don't necessarily have the opportunity, right? Because like uh, so many places I worked with, was just like every time I was on a video call with someone, we were talking about work and it was not like, hey, let's come hang out. And some of that came down to time zone differences. I think you have to be intentional too. There were definitely times where it was like, hey, this is a, a social hour. Come hang yeah. out. We have but lunch and learns. Like, I think there's a lot of like, like we had apprentices, like lunches and all kinds of stuff. I think. If, but those if, are still inclusive of the time zone, right? Because like I work now with people around the world. Well, no, not necessarily because essays are global. And I thought I, I essays are are typically remote just by like function. Like they have always been remote, mo like way before COVID. And I felt probably the closest to some of my essay coworkers because like, and they were global all over the world, but it was just, I think also like being a solution architect requires a lot of people skills, you know, and tech skills. Sure. But in that case, like, Hey, let's do a lunch and learn. You have a yeah. global team. Someone's giving up a dinner time, not a lunch yeah. time. Someone's giving up a bedtime or a morning or, or, time or a morning time to meet the lunch. Yeah. I was like really early in the morning. Yeah. And that's one of those things that there's trade-offs with this remote culture and, and remotes. Everyone works anywhere around the world is great for flexibility. It allows you to do that stuff, but you have to be cognizant of like, oh, this isn't your lunch. This yeah. isn't your like, hey, look, we're going to have a happy hour at, after yeah. work today. And just like, oh, like it's 9 a.m. for me. What do you do? Like, I'm not going to show up with the. <laughs> we always did coffee and codes and some people would have happy hour and some people would have coffees. And it was really fun. Yeah. So like those are just things to consider. And and it's interesting. Also, it helps if you have a Slack, the Slack plugin thing that tells you where your coworkers are. So you can set like 
a reminder to send something in their appropriate time zone. That is such an underrated skill of productivity. <laughs> yeah. Set, set, setting your time zone up in your chat system and then having a way yeah. to only notify me out in these hours. Is, yeah. Is, well, it, you can also like say it at like 10 o'clock at night, you think of something, you can set it to send it to somebody at 9 a.m. in the morning for that person. I go back and forth on that one, right? Because like it is a great feature, but then it makes me check my messages at like 6 a.m. Or 7 a.m. If they get back to me, right? Because like- Oh, no, no, no. It sets it at 9 for them. No, no. Oh. They're 9 a.m. If they're oh, on the East Coast, I get what you're it's saying, 6 a.m. for me. And then it comes me. back. Okay. And yeah, so like yeah. I, at, at some point, I just want it to be asynchronous and say, hey, I'm not going to set the expectation that I'm going to respond right away. And I don't- That's actually that- my favorite emails for a long time. People were starting to put, I sent this when it was convenient for me and you send it back when it's convenient for you. And I'm like, yes. <laughs> right, that, that medium that medium matters because yeah. one is designed to be asynchronous. One's a little more synchronous or at least might be assumed to be. And so like, yeah, I always go back and forth. I'm like, should I schedule this for their time? And then I'm going to be, I don't know. It's hard. It's di- very difficult. But I think it's great that it's- being more con- talked about and as a lot of companies are either bringing people back into offices or more people are looking for new work that is more remote and, and flexible. Um, I have coworkers around the world and I really enjoy learning about, I learned last week that Easter, Orthodox Easter has a different date than Western Easter. And that was really fascinating. I did not know that. And it was like- All I, the cool Spain uh, holidays in Spain that were going on, I think last week, but I only learned that from having global coworkers. I have a coworker in Spain and yep, like people were just out of the office for a lot of the week. I'm like, why? I'm like, oh, cool. Like your culture has different things that you celebrate and that's awesome. And I get to learn about some of that stuff just by being exposed to it a little bit. It's so cool. Uh, my link of the week is very different. <laughs> <laughs> I stumbled upon this website uh, last week as I was looking up kernel parameters to provide in Linux. Um, And they're called syscontrol values that you have to set in kernel parameters. And this is called syscontrol-explorer.net. And it allows you to like figure out what these settings mean because they're all kind of obscure. They have short names for various things. um, And you may not know what they're for and what they do. And it doesn't go into a lot of detail, but it's starting. And I found this website and I found it useful already because I looked up a couple of things that were part of these parameters I wanted to set. I was looking for a specific one and they they have plans to maybe expand this also to things like SysFS, um, the virtual file system for Linux parameters and things like proc um, that are, are also useful. So uh, Sys, Sys Control Explorer was just a very practical thing that I found that I, I was like, hey, I'm gonna put that in the show notes because I already used it twice and I think other people might uh, find it useful as well. I love that when you find or just anyone finds something cool and then you like post it or talk about it. And then it's just a great way of finding new like productivity hacks and cool tools that you've never used. Right. I mean, I spend so much time in man pages and I'm like, oh, this is just a different web interface for it. And that is also useful. So it's also really interesting how so many like engineers or system devs or just, you know, people have different processes like Emacs users, like love them some Emacs, you know, like, <laughs> and like people will get into whole fights about languages or like Vim versus like Neo Vim. And they're just like, it's just so funny. Like people just get Tabs so, and spaces yes, like, yep. it's like, I love the passion. Also, we're ridiculous, but it, yeah. <laughs> love it. Like, <laughs> All right. So let's jump into our interview with Andrew and talk all about Postgres. What's up, friends? Is your code getting dragged down by joins and long query times? The problem might be your database. Try simplifying the complex with graphs. A graph database lets you model data the way it looks in the real world instead of forcing it into rows and columns. Stop asking relational databases to do more than what they were made for. Graphs work well for use cases with lots of data connections like supply chain, fraud detection, real-time analytics, and generative AI. With Neo4j, you can code in your favorite programming language and against any driver. Plus, it's easy to integrate into your tech stack. People are solving some of the world's biggest problems with graphs, and now it's your turn. Visit neo4j.com slash developer to get started. Again, neo4j.com slash developer. That's neo4j.com slash developer.
All right, thank you so much, Andrew Atkinson, for coming on the show today. Andrew, uh, let's talk about some uh, databases and Ruby. What do you say? Yeah, thanks for having me. Excited to be here. Let's do it. Yeah, tell us a little about yourself. Yeah, uh, my name's Andrew Atkinson. Uh, I've been a software engineer for about 15 years at uh, mostly uh, startups, mid-sized companies, but I've also worked for some bigger companies, Microsoft and Groupon. And um, the last few years, I've been going more into a specialty area, which is database performance and kind of actually kind of all things Postgres related specifically, having used it at a bunch of companies and then moving into this like a bit of education and advocacy as well for that tech stack. But yeah, I, day to day, I'm, I'm working as a developer and outside of work, I'm a dad and have a couple young kids. And How many kids do you have? Got two girls. Two younger oh, girls. That's awesome. Yeah. Your house must be so like cute and peaceful. We got a lot of cute stuff, dresses I'm and so dolls. We got, we, uh, both of us have all boys. I it have three right. boys <laughs> and it smells. is just chaos. <laughs> and like they're so stinky. Like they used to be really cute and now they're cute, but like kind of smelly. Yeah. And like there's Minecraft stuff everywhere. And like I'm so jelly. Like you must get to buy cute clothes. You know what boy clothes are? Shorts and shirts over and over and over again. Yeah, I can see that. Yeah, <sighs> my my wife's like the lead clothing purchaser, and uh, I just I'm kind of along for the ride. But I do like the. <laughs> You're like I just, <laughs> I just work here. <laughs> <laughs> I like these titles we have here. Like this is like hey, I like a product manage some clothes here and see. Yeah. How this is going to go. <laughs> it's definitely about like yeah. I mean, I think like. I'm sure you all can relate, but I think we've been more successful as parents by like dividing certain responsibilities. You got to divide and yeah. conquer. Yeah. Like, see, you guys were smart and you had as many kids as like parents. And yeah, I'm yeah. Don't get out numbered. <laughs> Do not get I'm out outnumbered, y'all. Like, <laughs> <laughs> I'm like, everyone don't die. <laughs> right. I mean, divide and conquer with the, with the kids' responsibilities is also with your backlogs, right? And when you're choosing like, hey, we have a big backlog of things to do. Why in 2024 would someone pick Postgres as a database? Ah, yes. Nice segue. Uh, I, try. I, try. I try. Bring it back. Yes. I love when Justin like does dad jokes, but includes tech. Like it's just, it's great. I love it. I think being a postgrad specialist, I do think, you know, I've noticed people want me to like answer questions like this and it's not really, it's a little um, tricky because I haven't, I've just mostly been a user for a bit. And then, so to, just to be fully transparent, I feel like I've sort of backfilled some reasons. I do have an answer for your question, but one of the biggest things I tend to think about that a lot of folks mention is what's cool about Postgres. It's, you know, there are a lot of open source pieces of software, open source. We could get into the benefits of that, of course, but like what's interesting about Postgres is there isn't really just one specific company that drives the innovation of it and the maintenance of it. So it's really a collection of like loads of different companies are represented in who's actually a contributor and a committer to it. And then also the broader ecosystem, which includes, people like me speaking at conferences about it as a kind of the user side of it and that sort of thing. But what I like is in terms of that, um, you know, not single company, like it makes me feel good that it's going to be around. It's been around for decades. It's going to be around for decades more. And, you know, building a career around it, I think is a safer bet than technologies where, you know, they might be tied to one company's kind of quarter by quarter growth cycles. And so, I mean, I think there's, you know, for some people that's appealing um, just to, just to play dev, like if I said, replaced everything you just said about Postgres and put in Redis, yeah, all of those statements would be true, except for there was just a license change on Redis, right? Like this is a, yeah, it's true, yeah. a, a, a big concern in open source, anything right now. Um, not, not to derail the conversation, but I think that's an interesting like point of like, uh, absolutely everything you said is something I would have been saying about a lot of things three, four or five years ago. And now the industry has changed in various ways that, uh, that community backed open sources is a little harder to find. And, and maybe it's a foundation that has to run these things or, or be in charge of them. But uh, that's a really interesting like perspective, which is like, Hey, with a lot of contributors and a lot of uh, innovation and, and people like dedicated to this thing, like it can become a standard like Redis kind of did, like the Redis API is a standard that we can re-implement in many other ways. Um, but like the project itself, like what has become is like, well, is that the thing that I'm, am I allowed to use it anymore? Like there's a lot of other legal questions around those things. For sure. Yeah. And I've heard people use the term rug pull, you know, kind of the license change. And um, there are, uh, for anyone that's interested about this with Postgres, I personally haven't gone into a lot of deep thinking about it, but there are people that have been writing about, will Postgres ever pull a rug pull sort of thing? And I guess a couple more things that come to mind along those lines to me is, 
Another big reason to choose Postgres is its extensibility. And if you look into the ecosystem, you know, a lot of folks don't know even that there is an extensions mechanism and that there's a lot of commercial companies that are building commercial extensions and hosting platforms with Postgres as its core. And I think that like also kind of like, I guess to maybe contradict a bit of there isn't a single company, I guess, well, maybe it doesn't contradict. There's a, a dozens of companies that are building on Postgres. And I don't know if I know how that's going to shake out, but like it, to me, it sort of broadens the user base and the financial backing and the financial interest and that sort of thing. Here's the weird thing though, for me, it's like, there's all the commercial side of software and stuff like this, but if I'm also involved a bit, mostly just as a reader, but within the email based Postgres, they call it the hackers list, but with the actual kind of trunk or main development that's going on, like I'll tend to follow the list a bit. There's this kind of, uh, two worlds, I think of commercial software and all of that and making money off open source software is not trivial. And I don't really, I'm not an expert on that at all, but then there's kind of like this real tangible connection with the actual development of it. That's very much like standards oriented. We're trying to, um, we're going to implement a feature that has standards that it's associated with. We're going to implement high leverage features. We're going to maintain backwards compatibility and, Um, I'm rambling a bit, but just to wrap it up here, like there's the actual people doing the development. And I wanted to mention this too, that like I've had the privilege now of attending a few Postgres conferences and you can just meet these people like they're there and you can interact with them on the list. And these are some really, you know, prolific, super knowledgeable programmers that some of them work for these big companies, but some of them are, you know, I don't know, like kind of volunteers, I guess that sort of makes me feel like gives me some confidence in the project's longevity too. You know what I mean? Like regarding the license change and all that. Yeah. There's just a lot of people involved. I mean, I think if you look at the last release of Postgres, it was something like 300 named people in the either contributors or committers list. We're already at the point where we are trying so hard to get people to contribute to open source and looking at how we can get more people to contribute. And now like, how do we stop people from having the fear that you're going to contribute to this new thing? And then the rug's going to get pulled. So I do think that's like a really interesting conversation. Did you go to Postgres Chicago Day? I did. Yeah, I I was able to present there too, which was just last Friday uh, from when we're recording this. Yeah. Like, for example, um, there's also this Postgres ecosystem. I wanted to just quickly shout out PG Analyze, which is a commercial Postgres observability tool. I've been using it with a couple clients I've been consulting with. I'm a big fan of it. But like Lucas, who's the founder, was there at the conference and you know, it was nice to engage, but also at the conference were sponsors, big companies like Microsoft was there. They have a number of employees that uh, work full time on Postgres as contributors or committers. So yeah, I guess like, I I know we're kind of like at the industry level, maybe here, I could also zoom way into like the individual developer level for the why Postgres. Does that work? Should we do that? Let's do why and maybe why not. Because, oh, I, there's another lady named Henrietta that I've met. She came to my skill yeah. talk and she invited me to uh, Postgres Chicago, but I couldn't go because it's between scale and possibly Grace Hopper. But I think it's cool that there's a lot of push to get women into the Postgres community, which I think is, oh, I just, it just seems very welcoming to me. I think that's really rad. And she gave me some tickets that we got to donate to Mill Spouse Coders. So I definitely appreciate like the Postgres community and how like, they're really trying to get more people like kind of into, you know, like the community and give people options. I thought that was really cool. They gave us tickets to give away. So I thought that was really nice of her. She was really cool. Yeah. Henrietta uh, is uh, someone who I, I call a friend now. We've been able to meet a couple of times and uh, she's amazing. She's very knowledgeable and she's super kind. Yeah. So she's also a author of um, her book. I was just making sure I had the title, right? It's called Postgres Query Optimization. And it's one, it's a book that I read as part of like what led me into wanting to write a book. Mm -hmm. I've also been able to connect with Henrietta about the author experience and stuff and and writing about Postgres. But yeah, I, I really like, she runs the Postgres Chicago meetup as well, besides the conference. She's the leader of the PG day, which was is in its second year this year. And it's something they're going to keep doing. So it'll be available next year, 2025. And yeah, I I agree. Like it's, there's definitely an explicit emphasis on, um, diversity of all types for attendees, but a focus on women, non-binary, um, you know, not men. Cause unfortunately, like with our, you know, industry in general, like with the disparities that are in place, like within databases, I think it's some of the same problems that are even worse, you know, like imbalances. 
Yeah. Because database is a very, n- not niche, but like a unique niche. Like people are usually like DBAs or like kind of fell into it some way. So it's not like a lot of traditional like, hey, you just go to college and you're going to work in databases, you know? So yeah, I thought it was cool that she not only is like to see a woman in databases in like a more of a um, leadership role, you know? And she's extremely welcoming and very like she's doing a lot of things. I thought that was cool because representation really matters. And you can say that you want diversity, but Postgres community, I feel like does a lot of actually like walking the walk and like actually doing it, you know? So I thought that was really cool. It's a very cool, welcoming open source community. Yeah. That's great to hear. You know, Melanie Plageman is a, a, she just recently was honored as a, she's been a long time contributor to Postgres. Uh, she works at Microsoft and became recently a committer, which is a, oh, wow. a noteworthy achievement because you have to be a contributor for years and and kind of earn the the that's ability to deal. commit. Yeah. So that's really cool. I've also met like Laetitia uh, Avro, who's based in France. She's a frequent conference presenter, a working DBA and works with EDB and is big on bringing more women into the community and and also, you know, super intelligent, kind person that I've been able to meet through the events. So, yeah, I mean, for anyone listening to this that's curious, like if you are a little bit interested in Postgres events or databases, um, and even if you're a developer that's not working as a DBA, um, I found them to be really nice community events. They have single day and multi day events. So, yeah, check those out. Also, another funny thing is I feel like a lot of people don't realize there's a ton of vendor databases that are built on Postgres. So people will be like, well, why use Postgres? You're kind of using Postgres in a lot of areas. Like, <laughs> yeah. And that's just the ones that people tell people about. There's probably a ton of other databases that are like low-key Postgres underneath the hood. So I think Postgres is much more powerful of a skill because it like a lot of people don't get into databases and learn data modeling or learn like really in depth in databases. And they think it's just like, but everything uses data, you know? So like everything is going to store data, use it, pull it from it or whatever. So I think it's a worthy skill. Also, you guys uh, donated a ticket and we got to give that ticket from Gil- from Mill Spouse Coders to like somebody who was laid off so they could go and talk nice. to people and get jobs. So I really appreciate that. That's really good to hear. So a, a lot of this is, you know, like why Postgres has been around a while, why why the community is growing and is great and, and why we want to use it. Why would someone not want to use Postgres? Like that's the other end of it, right? Because that's where I usually kind of pull out the like, oh no, I've seen it, the bad things or, or I've, you know, having a little more exposure into other databases. Like, I mean, like Postgres first, my SQL is, is kind of a straightforward maybe comparison. Um, but like even something else that's like a no SQL database, like why would someone not choose Postgres? I got a couple of ideas to answer this question, but I'll just also say like, it's not really where I'm spending a lot of my energy on. I'm, I'm more sure. like, you know, uh, working on Postgres specifically. So I tend to have a very like, a echo chamber social media situation and you know people i talk with and whatnot but like at a past company i was at for example they were looking into using pinecone as a place to store vector embeddings information and we were trying to add ai features to the application and there's a lot of energy in the industry now around different vector storage options and so maybe someone might want to say well Maybe we want a dedicated vector storage database for its performance benefits, its index types, that sort of thing. With that being said, again, the extensibility of Postgres, PG Vector has become very popular as a Postgres extension to store vector embeddings. And there's a lot of folks writing about why you might want to stick with Postgres. Uh, you know, if you're using it for like your application database, or maybe you're running a second instance that's more focused on your AI use cases, your vector storage. I think that when you're choosing between Postgres and NoSQL, though, it's kind of bigger of like just what NoSQL versus a relational database does, right? So relational databases are great for when you know what your access pattern is going to be and what you know when you know what your database structure is going to be and it's going to stay that way continuously and you're going to pull the same type of like structure over and over and over again when you need a more unstructured database or flexible you're going to want NoSQL. so i think that they're different data models because even the databases that are typically built on postgres are relational databases so it's more like relational versus non-relational but even as we like andrew was just saying 
having a vector plugin, right? Like vector PG, like allows you to store vectors, which uh, I think there's also like a, a, a graph database, which I mean, vector is very related to that. Uh, yeah. I still don't understand the difference between a graph database and a vector database. And I've tried to ask this multiple times and everyone's just like, well, one has direction. I'm like, well, yeah, but node edges can have directions too, right? Like, I don't understand. If someone knows, please reach out to me. I would love, <laughs> I've, I've asked this multiple times at conferences and people and like, I cannot get a good explanation that I understand. And that's probably the, the low bar of like trying to hammer it home for me. But like Postgres is so flexible in that like you can have like raw JSON documents as in a, in a no SQL style, like just store yep. these bits, right? Yeah, Adam, I've, I've heard that. And I think that's like what a lot of folks say that, you know, if you don't really know and, and actually I tried to directly address that in writing about the JSON storage options in Postgres when I was writing about that too, where it's like, well, imagine I w- there's an example app for the book. Mm-hmm. And I was like, imagine you wanted to store a bunch of metrics about a new feature area and you didn't really know which metrics you would have, like what their data types would be, mm-hmm. like what you might store uh, as a value for those metrics. You know, it's kind of a mini example, but it sets up it's using uh, the JSON B column as a column, the data type within Postgres, which you can index and you can get good performance off of for querying. But you can also do things like there's an open source tool called JSON schema validation or something. Now I'm kind of forgetting the name, but what you can do is you can kind of do no, no schema or no SQL at the outset. You can just slam a blob of as long as it's JSON compatible text into a column. And then you can actually come back later and add type information and even check it automatically with a constraint. So you can say like, well, we actually have these few keys within here. They should have these data types for any new inserts or updates or deletes. Like we'll check them against the schema. You know, it's sort of like a a ninja move maybe, but it's like, oh, you want no schema? We can do that. And then we can add a schema later, you know, or we could. Well, which is interesting (laughs) because you do like, I think that when we say that it's like, you have to know your access patterns for NoSQL. Like if you want it to be efficient, like you'd need to be able to plan out your access patterns. And I think people hear the like unstructured data and they think you can just put whatever you want in there in any pattern. And that's not true if you want to be able to pull it out in like a proper way. So I do think that Postgres is probably like the most flexible version of, well, maybe the most flexible version of like relational database that is kind of comparable to like a mongo db or document db you know mm-hmm. but still i guess relational so i do think that that's what makes it a really interesting sql database you know yeah there's certainly those options there i'd say that you know i personally haven't worked on a really like big scale you know mongo or or kind of like no sql based primary persistence layer application i imagine it might there definitely are a lot of examples of folks migrating to Postgres, like migrating the data. Mm-hmm. I have done a bit of migration from Elasticsearch, which is a text search oriented sort of database optimized for full text search. Mm-hmm. And then sort of like wedging that data back from kind of a flat or JSON structured data into kind of like a normalized relational data model data. It's not super trivial, but um, from an infrastructure or from a like a query patterns perspective, like you were mentioning, I think a lot about the read and write query patterns for the application. And, you know, it's always kind of a trade-off between those two things where you might have really high ingestion rate data where maybe a less schema structure is going to be beneficial to receiving, you know, lots of data, like could be events or sensors or things like that. But then, you know, what, how are you querying that data? Do you need to then build like a secondary storage mechanism to query it efficiently? Are you willing to trade off? some write time latency to have better read latency. If you dig in a bit to Postgres, there's a lot of different features that can kind of, you can leverage to basically, you know, get more comparable performance to, you know, whether you're optimizing your writes or whether you want to take unstructured data and make it more efficient to read and that kind of thing. But like with that all said, I think um, if you do have a good idea, if you are in a position to choose Postgres or something else, and you have a really strong idea of your data ingestion and your query patterns, probably any good engineer would do. You you might want to try a couple alternatives and do some benchmarks, you know, simulate like loading a million rows, querying thousands of records and some sort of level of concurrency, that sort of thing. Is the current state of the art for scaling something like Postgres 
Um, I'm just like the last time I ran a database in any sort of like it needed to be reliable uh, and and I didn't want to lose the data situation. It was just like, oh, I just scaled it up, right? Like we just vertically scaled the machine uh, to one machine was good enough for our needs at the time. And then you could do things like, oh, we have read replicas and we just, we send the reads over there, we send the writes over here and then we balance or we load balance in front of that to say, is that still state of the art for how you're going to scale a Postgres database in 2024? Yeah, I mean, more or less. I mean, Postgres architecturally is still a single instance database, you know, so there's not a concept of nodes or different instances like in the core community Postgres distribution. But like Autumn was saying, there's lots of companies building on Postgres. So for example, Microsoft supports Citus, which is a multi-node Postgres distribution. So you can add more nodes if you want and you can distribute your writes and your reads to different nodes. So that is one way to scale up. That would be an alternative to just vertically scaling up a single instance. You know, you would scale out more by adding more nodes. Uh, Typically, though, the web applications I work on and with modern cloud providers, like you can get so much hardware, you know, so many resources on a single instance that I actually tend to encourage people like it's fine. Single instance scalability is fine. I mean, unless you're Google, you know, maybe, but like, you know, you can get servers with I saw at one point Amazon was going to launch and I'm sure Google Cloud Platform, Microsoft, these other big cloud providers have similar things, but uh, servers with 24 terabytes of RAM, you know? So, I mean, if you can get more RAM than the size of your database, all of your queries are going to fit into the memory of your instance and you're going to have super high performance queries, even with relatively minimal effort, like on indexing and things like that. So if it's staying one instance, how do you kind of make sure you're getting it like highly available everywhere because it's only on one instance. Yeah, you would definitely set up replication. And so Postgres has a couple replication types. You can do physical and then you can do logical, which is really cool. Logical gives you a lot of options to slice and dice your portions of your database that you want to replicate and whatnot. But yeah, like like Justin was saying, most of the times that I've worked on Postgres at bigger scale, it's with web applications where there are loads more reads than writes. So there, you know, it could be one or more read replicas. Yeah. And um, of course, like, as you all may know, a lot of the modern, the more modern Postgres hosting options, they do kind of a compute and storage separation. So essentially with more of a shared storage model across nodes, you can kind of take away the problem of replica latency that would, you know, that might affect your ability to query data on a replica. Which you need to, because I mean, you need it just for backups, because if not, like, you know, you take out your database and you've lost all your data. So, right. I mean, that makes sense. Some folks might run a replica, even if they don't actively use it by the application, just as a failover mechanism. So you can, you know, and Postgres supports this natively. You can do a promotion of a standby server running in a read-only mode to become the new writable primary node. It's like amazing. Hadoop's built on it. Um, Red Hat's database is built on it. Uh, I think Redshift may have it somewhere in there. So it's crazy. Redshift, yeah, is on an old version of Postgres per my last understanding, like nine dot something. So it's like amazing. Like people will like turn their nose up at Postgres and I'm like, that's because you don't know what's built on Postgres. <laughs> like, yeah, I mean, like uh, Yugabyte is another multi-node Postgres uh, option that is both open source and they have a commercial hosting option. Time scale. I could rattle off five or six more companies, but yep, for sure. I remember reading Yale's, uh, I think they have a paper on Hadoop and it's amazing the way that they like built it. It's crazy. For one, Postgres and SQL are easy, like not easy, but like SQL is taught in all like college courses, right? Like for databases. So you know that you will be able to get people to work on that database, right? So you can find people with those skills. So if you can make Postgres like highly available and you can do that the things that you can do with JSON here like it is easier to get more people to work on a Postgres database than to get people to work on a NoSQL database you know so it's like a lot of things you can you can do what you need to do to make something work for you if you have the right skill you know Mm -hmm. because every database has caveats right but I think Postgres is always going to have the fact that you it's easy to find people to work with it, you know, and then you have to get people that are good at performance. Obviously that's not as easy to find, but as far as querying it, it is easy to find examples. I'm available for consulting, but yes, yes, I agree. (laughs) (laughs) And that's a huge piece, right? Cause like the the lower in the stack you get, or the closer you get to the bits that you store, the more paranoid you have to get 
with how it's used and where it's available and how it's accessed and all this stuff like becomes more critical. Like if you're, if you have physical hard drives in a data center, like you have to back them up. And like, it was like, that is on me to do it. If I'm throwing something in S3, I don't care. Like it's, you know, the 18 nines that Amazon gives me for that, you know, data, like I'm fine with that. It's like, as long as my access patterns match, but that closer you get to that data that you're responsible for, the more important it is to have someone that knows what they're doing. Mm -hmm. It's so interesting. I think that's what the thing is. Like cloud was so famous and now we're going back to on-prem. All these NoSQL databases were so famous and now people are migrating from NoSQL back to like Postgres. And it's like, it really shows you like people went for like what was really popular and now we're going back to the, almost the basics, maybe not the basics. Fundamentals, right? Yes, you know what I mean? Like, you know what? This has been working for a while for a lot of people and and this makes sense uh, if we have the skill set. It's really interesting to see how things are shifting I'm curious, like as that pendulum swings back, like what are the skill sets that are hard to get now, right? Like you, you mentioned, like if people are moving back on prem, most of the developers that I have talked to and work with, like they've never run a data center. They don't know what it's like. Like they haven't been inside the the cold aisle or the hot yeah. aisle. And but it was funny because like five years ago when I like started in tech, there were a bunch of DBAs trying to learn how to do managed databases. Because that was where the jobs were swinging. Yep. And now, like, and I, like, I know people who are some of the best database people and they had a hard time getting jobs because of ageism. And I'm like, you better be nice to those people. They know how to run a database on prem. Like, <laughs> yeah. be nice to them. Like, yeah, really. but it's interesting. Like, and it's such a interesting, like, you, certain things you'll only learn from going back and forth to those two. And that, the ability to give the advice of like managed database versus on prem, or you know, to be able to say, "Hey, relational versus Postgres," like that was one of the most important things I learned. Being able to really compare relational and non NoSQL databases, and I think that goes right back to the like skill sets, right? Because like a lot of people went to managed databases because they didn't have the skill sets in house to manage something critical. Well, not just that, but they wanted to start a smaller team. And a lot of what cloud did was say, hey, you don't need a DBA. You don't need an administrator. We're going to take all that for you and you just need to- You outsource your ops. Yeah. You just need to get so many devs and we'll handle all the other stuff for you. And now people are like, we want to make it cheaper. And I'm like, yeah, you got to pay people. Is it cheaper? Like it's this, it's, it's all trade-offs. It is. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, the thing that most people don't think about is like Amazon runs on prem, like AWS, like it runs on prem and they have people that do the things on prem. That's what I'm saying. Like, I don't think that either is that like it, I don't think NoSQL versus relationship relational databases are a for sure answer. And I don't think on prem versus cloud is a for sure answer, but they're all trade-offs. And I think people are like, I think it's hilarious when they're like, cloud is expensive and I'm going to go on prem. And I'm like, you need to hire a very smart DBA. Ex- expensive yes. engineers. Yeah. But also sometimes on prem can be better. So it's just like people don't, but nobody wants to be flexible about learning those trade offs to really do their due diligence. They just want to hype up a train that somebody put on Twitter. And I'm like, that, no, <laughs> like, you can't spend millions of dollars because some dude said something on Twitter. <laughs> yeah. I just, I feel like as I've worked at different companies and have been, more as an application developer and then more on infrastructure teams too. Like I've kind of come back to some fundamentals like SQL. It's beneficial whether you're doing OLTP application work or analytical style OLAP type of work for application developers. There's, you know, whether it's on-prem or hosted, like I think the best return on investment is learning query planning, learning index design and being able to learning how to put in yes, that like your data modeling and how you're putting in the data and out because that will save you so much money. Like like, that. (laughs) That's a big point when I was asking about like scalability, right? Because like I'm talking about like the systems, like do we how do we scale these out? How do we scale them up? You're like, actually, you could just like structure your data better right and optimize your queries and you don't like if there's anything i want to learn from all the people that are like ogs and databases is learning really good to be at good at data modeling because you can save people millions of dollars people are all about like we need bigger instances and we need a skill no be efficient like yeah. with your yeah. resources <laughs> like it's amazing like i just remember being in rooms and i would just listen to them talk and i'm like you guys are amazing like what they can do like it's not so much what you're like you can do a lot of whatever you're working with if you're doing it efficiently and you know what you're doing like having that knowledge is amazing yeah so i think that that was part of what fired me up about the book concept too is i think that there's a lot of developers focus on kind of like programming language or application framework level optimizations, which are good too. But a lot of times they might miss that a big portion of performance has to do with 
what data we're accessing. Nobody teaches that in school. Right. Yeah. Like, you know, whether it's writing or reading data, but usually reading data, like how do we access the smallest bit of data and how that actually shakes out to latency with basically file system access on a database server and doing that efficiently with minimal latency and and being able to really introspect and use the observability tooling that's built in, for example, for Postgres. And by the way, yeah, actually I'll, I'll answer your original question one more time is the query planner information with every release of Postgres, they keep adding more and more query planner optimizations. So they look at different types of query patterns and they're like, hmm, how can we solve this like at the planner level, which is super cool, I think. But also as a developer learning to use that information, I do think Postgres, I've heard from others, has the most information available and possibly the, you know, one of the better query planners. Again, it's open source versus like a commercial relational database, which is going to be able to pour lots of resources into that too. But like as an open source database, the level of information, it, you know, it's not super easy, but it's straightforward to learn bit by bit, like what all the parts mean. And as a, a user of the database, you can get a lot of deep knowledge about what's actually happening with your query workload. And if you can then apply that to design more efficient schemas, better supportive indexes and that sort of thing, like Autumn was saying, you can you can save a lot of money just by doing less work with your... Is there like a... Like I think of distributed tracing for applications, right? Like that span trees and, and like the waterfalls. Does like a query planner have that amount of detail? Um, because like, what's the oh, flame graphs, right? Like yeah. uh, that you get for like an application, like my binary spinning up, where is it spending all its time? I'm assuming that exists for something like Postgres. Right? Yeah, that is really what I'm talking about. Yeah, yep. that's cool. So like in Postgres and other relational databases, they support the the explain keyword. And then there's different levels of additional parameters you can add, like analyze, buffers, verbose, et cetera, that give you more and more information. But you can get very granular on, for each table that's accessed, how specifically is it accessed? You can look at which pages are accessed behind the scenes. You can look at any CPU operations like filtering, sorting, et cetera. And you can see the costs of each of those pieces. So then you can zero in on the most costly pieces and address those and improve your overall performance. That's the topic I'm most passionate about lately. It's what I spoke at at PG Day Chicago. And I have a couple of presentations coming up on this topic as well. If people had more knowledge and when you start building your great idea, your team's like Docker, you know, like when you're building that service, if you put more thought into how you're going to put this data in and access it, it will not only save you a ton of money, but it saves you like so many people have to go through painful rewrites or you're doing like things that are just so much more work because you didn't think of that up front. So that is having the knowledge out there to be able to give developers that information to make good decisions is so underrated, which makes Postgres so underrated because I feel like the, for one, it's a ton of examples out there ton of like more knowledge and books and the fact that you have these uh tools you know and that you can do a little bit of what non-relational database gives you well it's still relational but NoSQL gives you Mm -hmm. but also have all that uh knowledge and like information out there is really important yeah and i i like you can run postgres locally you can run it in a vm or a container so it's easy to just play around with on your local laptop you can load in millions of records and you can play around and get a sense for your production-like environment and really build the skills hands-on yourself, which is a big part of what I like and isn't always the case for some offerings. You know, it's hard to like, can you really get a copy of this particular database engine locally? And can I really like easily set up a, a lab, sort of, so to speak, to test it out? And you can do that with Postgres, which is fun. So it's, it's a great way to um, really build. And as a developer myself, like I've always learned the most by hands-on work and building little things is so important yeah and being able to also when you're stuck and something breaks there's so much information out there to be like hey i had this problem did you have this problem (laughs) like you know because that's kind of like who wants to get stuck somewhere and you can't fix it like that's part of our jobs (laughs) you know so fixing problems yep for sure yeah so i think postgres is very underrated as a database why is your place to wrap up because i i 
Completely agree. Like being able to learn something on your own time on something that you already own locally. Like I could just run it on my my laptop, my desktop and poke at it and send some, you know, example data sets into it and then figure out like, okay, how do, how would I optimize this? Um, sometimes it's, it's too much to like take in. Like you have to have a little, some guides on like, Hey, like I want to fit it in these areas, which I know Andrew, you do a lot of with like Ruby on rails and Postgres. Mm -hmm. Like you could say like, Hey, let's narrow down the scope of what we want to try to do. Uh, and let's just spin up an example Ruby on Rails app with a Postgres database, and then we can go from there. Every time I hear Ruby, I think about the four hours I spent trying to find an end to like one of the, I don't know what you'd call it, like methods or whatever, and I like needed another end, and I was building an alarm. <laughs> oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. my God. Those four hours of my life, I will never get back. Like, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> like, why are they like, can we get better errors? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, unfortunately, like with a dynamic language, you can get some really non-clear errors. But I was like, who uses this for infrastructure? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but yeah. My, Don't give um, me that face, Justin. We I'm, know what we're both talking about, but still. <laughs> Oh, he just drank. Did you see the tea? Okay, for the listeners, you can't see that. Justin <laughs> just took like the biggest sip of tea, but like that's just, we're going to ignore that. Like, this eyes. is water. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, that's true. Whether you use, um, you know, I know uh, I've got connections that are in like PHP Laravel world, Django Python, you know, Java, Drop Wizard is a, a framework I used to use at a past employer. If you have the opportunity to do app development with Postgres, you can run it all locally. And you can really build a lot of those skills hands-on, which I think is really cool. And I, I also wanted to just quickly mention that the app I use for the book is on GitHub. It's public. Anyone can look at it. You don't need to buy the book. And so if someone wants to like a little silly app to play with and um, they can boot the schema up and play around and modify it and stuff, that's an option as well. That's awesome. I mean, those little silly apps go a long way. Like they that do. just gets someone started. So Andrew, if anyone wants to reach out to you online, where would they find you? Yeah, I blog at andyatkinson.com. Uh, I'm also on Twitter, A-N-D-A-T-K-I, LinkedIn, Mastodon. Uh, you can find me on those places. We got to get you on Blue Sky too. I'm on Blue Sky. It's really Yay. sad. Blue Sky built on Postgres. Uh, fun <gasps> fact, if you didn't know That's that. That's awesome. Yeah. <laughs> it was nice meeting you. Likewise, yeah. Nice to meet you, Justin and Autumn. And yeah, thanks again for the opportunity to be here with you. Thanks so much for coming. Thanks again, Andrew, for coming on the show and talking to us all about Postgres and a little bit of Ruby and how how it works, how it runs and, and how to upgrade it, all this stuff. It's great as me from, I've always been avoiding databases pretty much my entire career. And Come to the dark side. <laughs> and hearing from people that actually enjoy it and, and know how it works uh, is always uh, refreshing that I get to learn lots of things. For today's outro, we have a few open source projects that uh, we recently found and we just thought were kind of interesting, so we wanted to share them. And I'm going to go first with mine. Uh, I got one called RHTTP, and it stands for REPL for HTTP. And so if you don't know what a REPL is, it's basically like, a, what's it called? Re wait, read, evaluate, print loop. That's what it is. Read, evaluate, print loop. I cannot remember that. So it's, it's, it's like people use different tools for this. Um, Postmate, not Postmate. Postman. Postman? Yeah, yeah. Postman is like the, the GUI version of like, hey, I need to send a request to a website, see what JSON I get back or what data I get back. And our HTTP basically does that in a TUI, in a terminal user interface. So you don't get a GUI, but you get all the same sort of output where you're saying like, I need this URL, I'm putting this data. You could do it with curl, but sometimes it's hard to like curl and JQ and all this stuff. And our HTTP puts it all in a nice TUI for you to interact with the, the website. Uh, the next one I share, I'll share is called TU2, and, um, and it's a command line tool to convert natural language date time into UTC. And I, I love this. Can we just talk about how little things like that can just ruin your whole day? Like, <laughs> <laughs> like there's like little tiny things that like tell me you want to ruin an engineer's day and chain, make little small changes in those things and you just throw so many things off it's ridiculous yeah and, and like i mean utc is the one true time zone uh, for anyone running systems and so everything should be in utc but sometimes it's hard to be like wait when did this happen if i'm writing a postmortem yeah. or something i'm like okay wait what am i doing and so tu is just a command line tool and you say like tu space tomorrow and it'll tell you like it'll take the now time and it converts it directly into a utc timestamp 
but oh, then you could go that. search for something and it's just like boom you just you get the full string with everything that you normally because i'm always like wait which form and you're like i know the standard format but i don't want to type it out i don't want to think about it those are the things technology that makes like it all worth it when it's something that makes your life easier or automate something and it's just like someone thought of this because it solved a problem and then made it and then allowed everyone to like use it and make their lives better it makes me happy right and when I found two, I was just like, I was like, oh, this is what I needed because I wanted like TU last week or yesterday at midnight and you could just do that standard, what I would think of as what time that was. And then I automatically get the UTC timestamp from it. And the last one I want to share is called uh, Poetry Camera. And this is a project that I, I randomly camera? found, Poetry Camera. So I found it on uh, TikTok, I believe. Someone was um, the, the lady that's building it. She's, yeah, she's, she has, you can take a Raspberry Pi Zero. This is for you, Autumn. This is for your kids. It's oh built on God. a Raspberry Pi Zero and it runs a Python script with a local large ish language model, right? And it has an like, actual camera attached to it. So you, you take a picture and it spits out, it actually prints out text of a poem about what it sees. You don't get a print out of the picture. You get a, a poem representing what the camera saw. My kids would make so many ridiculous poems about <laughs> just ridiculous like Cheetos or something. Like, well, I mean, how many how many co poems can you write about a butt? Right? Like that's what my kids would do. It's just like <laughs> Dude, my kids <laughs> will put the word fart in anything. Like it's horrible. Like I, and then they still think it's funny like after the million time like it does not lose its steam. I don't understand. Like I'm just like how many times can that be funny? <laughs> So yeah, so this project was cool because it, it runs on a Raspberry Pi Zero. If you have one sitting in a, in a drawer somewhere, it does need some other hardware. Raspberry Pi needs to like sponsor you and my children at this point yeah. <laughs> and Alan. Like, <laughs> But it's cool that it has, you know, it's battery powered. It has a shutter button and it takes a camera and it has a little printer that you can get with it. And it's, it's just neat. It's like, it's a cool little Python program. That's actually cool. They're actually trying to build a Raspberry Pi with a security camera. Not that they need a security camera. Oh. <laughs> uh, and this one actually has a website. I don't remember what the full, uh, I think it's probably just like poetry camera. Poetry.camera is the website. So you can see it. It's actually a fully 3D printed case and everything. We'll put the link in the show notes because um, she is making it, but the project is open source and you can you can build one yourself if you wanted to. That's really cool. How about you? Oh, so I've got a repo of a bunch of open source projects done, uh, created by women, which I thought was cool because some of these I had no idea. And also the fact that there's like not as many women in open source, I thought that was really cool. And some of them have really cool names, like Ghost and Exorcism. I was like, I just want to know what it is. Like, <laughs> like <laughs> Ghost is a blogging platform and it's a, a pretty popular one. It's like blogging and newsletters. So, oh, and Liz Rice is on there. Liz is great. It was really cool that a lot of, Neat people contribute to these open source, just I meant to these repos. I love a good Git repo that tells you about a bunch of different projects. They're like awesome treasure lists. troves. Yes. Like yes. you just like end up finding all these cool things that you would have never came across before. I'm a maintainer for two awesome lists that. And uh, you didn't even give them to me yet. What is this friendship based on? Well, I don't know like, if you want my awesome. My, well, I have an awesome Tmux list. So if you use Tmux in your terminal. Are these boring awesome lists? Or are no, they, cool? they are ops focused. <laughs> only. Awesome Tmux is is my repo. And uh, what is my other awesome? Oh, awesome Tui's uh, terminal user interfaces. I'm just a big uh, terminal user. And so the, the awesome Tui's is actually how I found the R H T P because that one like someone pull, added a pull request and it's great because like when you have a popular awesome list people send you cool stuff and i'm like i never would have found this otherwise and people are like yeah this is i just built it and so it's been great because i learned about a lot of tmux tricks and a lot of uh twoies that i would not have known of otherwise when people just share like all the things that they're really into and that's a subject that you're really into and then you find all these cool ways to make your life better it makes me yeah. happy so we will have those uh, links in the show notes. And uh, thanks again, Andrew, and for everyone listening. Again, if you would like to hear from someone on the show, if you have a cool project, feel free to send us an email. It's ship it at changelog.com, and we will talk to you all next week. Thanks for listening to Ship It with Justin Garrison and Autumn Nash. Subscribe now if you haven't already. Head to shipit.show for all the ways, or just search for Ship It wherever you get your podcasts. You'll find us. Thanks once again to our partners at fly.io, to The Mysterious, Breakmaster Cylinder, for these dope beats. 
and to Sentry. Use code CHANGELOG when you sign up and save 100 bucks off their team plan. That's all for now, but come back next week when we continue discussing everything that happens after Get Push.